it's good stuff. Okay, so let's begin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. As salatu was salamu ala al mabruthi rahmata lil alameen wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yom al-deen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad kama barakta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim inna ka hamidun majid. As always, we will begin by sending salah and salam on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallam. جزا الله عنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم بما هو أهله اللهم صل وسلم أشرف الصلاة والتسليم على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has allowed us once again to gather and he is allowing us to revisit the life of his beloved Habib صلى الله عليه وسلم and he is allowing us to beautify our tongues, our mouths, our kalam, our speech by the mention of our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As the poet said, that my words cannot praise Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, rather the mention and the praise of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam elevates the rank it, it raises the level of my words. It beautifies my speech just by the mention of his beloved and blessed name, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, inshallah, we'll continue where we left off last time, and that was, we went over the incident of the elephants, we went over the incident that occurred at the time of Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's birth. It was in the same year as the birth of Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that leads us to our topic today, and that is the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's birth, as we have seen the, over the past few classes, his birth was the beginning of the play, the stage had been set, and now the curtain was about to be withdrawn. When you go to a play, you go to a stage and you see that there's a play going to occur and there's something that's about to happen. First the stage is set, the mood is set, and then the curtain is withdrawn and you see what the whole play is about. The birth of the Prophet wasallam was that withdrawing of the curtain. It was that presentation of what everything, all the preparation that had been done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all the work that had been placed, all the coincidences that we, as we would look at had, had, had fallen in place, how, how all the dominoes had fallen in the right exact moment, in the right exact place, in order for us to witness the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a momentous occasion. It was, as the poet Hassan bin Thabit radiallahu ta'ala said, it was that the day that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born, <coughs> that itself was the day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completed his favors on this world. His birth itself was the completion of the favors of Allah on humanity, on mankind. But in order for us to understand and appreciate the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it's important that we learn a little bit about his parents as well. First and foremost, right, we have a couple opportunities here to earn some lollipops. This is for sorry, the younger guys. Right. So I know, I said uncle, you're looking forward to a lollipop, but uh, this, is, this is only for the younger folks. Younger heart, right? Younger heart. You can take this for Saad. <laughs> so first and foremost, what was the name of the mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? What was her name and what was her father's name? Maybe that's too difficult. What was the name of the mother of the Prophet or something? One of the, or one of the younger guys? Younger guys, younger guys. Come on, man. Like, like, you're a grown man working there. <laughs> Go ahead, Mustafa. Amina. Good job. Here's your lollipop. You can come get it right now. Uh, she's going to throw food. So, here. 
Good job. All right, we'll have a couple more opportunities. That, that was an easy one. That was to get the, get, get the wheels moving. They'll, they'll get harder as we progress, inshallah. Right? Yeah, don't worry. There's, there's plenty of opportunities, inshallah. Okay? So yes, the name of the mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Amina bint Wahab. Amina, the daughter of Wahab. Amina bint Wahab is the mother of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So let's briefly look into her life and who she was. She was born to Wahab ibn Abd Munaf. And she, she was from the Qurayshi tribe as well. She was from the Qurayshi tribe of Banu Zahra. Meaning, she was from the same clan. She was, sorry, she was from the same uh, uh, Quraysh as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But... She was from Banu Zahra, as the Prophet, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was from Banu Hashim. So, and she was also, she was also a descendant of Ismail alayhi salam. This is important. She was also from amongst the descendants of Ismail alayhi salam, and her lineage met Abdullah's at the man by the name of Kilab. Which Abdullah is this, are we talking about here? Who is this Abdullah person that we're talking about? Lineage of, her lineage met the lineage of Abdullah at Kilab. Who is Abdullah? Another opportunity. Which Abdullah are we talking about here? The father of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, the father of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Remember, the Prophet sallallahu parents' name was Amina, was his mother's name, and his father's name was Abdullah. And so her lineage, meaning her forefathers, they met Abdullah's forefathers at a man by the name of Kilab. This is a few generations up. So. She was someone that married Abdullah by Abdul Muttalib. Abdul Muttalib had arranged this. Abdul, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he wanted to make sure that his son was married into a noble and a respectable family as well. And he wanted to make sure that not only he was married in Quraysh, but he wanted to make sure that he was he married into the family that was from the descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. That was important to them. That was extremely important to them. So Abdul Muttalib had proposed to Amina, uh, Amina's parents for his son, for his most beloved son, Abdullah, and they ended up marrying around the age of 18. They ended up marrying, she was around 18 years old when she married, uh, when she got married to Abdullah, the father of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Unfortunately, she, her, the marriage did not last for very long. And Abdullah became sick and he ended up passing away at a very young age, meaning only a few months into the marriage. So she was only married for a few months before she became a widow. And then she gave birth to the Prophet ﷺ roughly a year later at the age of 19. And she passed away, as we'll look at later on, maybe today, if not today, the next class, at the age of 25 in a place referred to as Abwa. Now, as we have said, Abdullah. Abdullah Bin Abdul Muttalib married Amina bin Wahab, and they were on their way to Syria. This is important as well. They were on their way to Syria, and Abdullah became sick. And when he became sick, they turned towards Yathrib. They turned towards what ended up becoming known as Medina Munawwara. But Abdullah ended up passing away at roughly around the age of 25 as well. Meaning, both of the parents of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they passed away around the same age. Right? They are passing around the same age, but there was a gap. Of, there was about a six year difference between both of them. And he passes away while Amina is pregnant. And most of the narrations suggest that Abdullah did not even know that Amina was expecting. Most of the narrations suggest that Abdullah, the father of the Prophet, وسلم, was not aware that his wife was expecting, and not only expecting, she was expecting the, the nur, the light of mankind, and that was Muhammad. Now, the part that he is buried in yesterday, this is something that is debated. That some narrations suggest that he's married in the outskirts of Medina, who became Medina now. Some narrations suggest that he wasn't, he did not reach yesterday, rather he was buried somewhere on the path, somewhere on the way. And there's more, there's more indication towards that, and there's a, that's the more stronger opinion as well, that he's buried somewhere in between Syria and Medina. The pathway somewhere along there he is buried. And something that we'll find out later on as well is that that means that both the parents of the Prophet وسلم, they passed away in journey, and both of them ended up being buried outside of major cities. They ended up being buried on the pathways. So the question comes, as we know, the Prophet's birth, he is born to Amin ibn Wahab, 
And when he is born, there's many narrations regarding this as well. Amina bint Wahab, she, she, she narrates to her servant, whose, whose name is Um Ayman, and this is an important name to keep in mind. He narrates, he narrates this to her servant, that I've seen a dream. I've seen a dream that there is a light that is emanating from my stomach. That there is a light that is emanating from my stomach. She sees this dream multiple times, not just once, but multiple times she sees that there is a light that is coming from her stomach. And thus, she, uh, Um Ayman, her servant, she recognizes that the, bir- the person that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that, that Amr bin Wahab is about to give birth to, this is going to be an important person. This is someone that's not going to be just some, ra- some a- average child, but this is going to be a very special child, in fact. And as we know, that when, when, when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was born, the narration suggests that there was a few things that occurred. There was a few things that occurred. The first and foremost, that there was a crack that appeared in the palaces of both the Byzantine Empire, that was the descendant of the Roman Empire, as well as the Sassanid Empire to the northeast, and that was the Persian Empire. The crack appeared in their palaces. Now, what does this mean? What is, what is the significance of that? Both of these kingdoms, both of these empires had been in existence for a very long time. We know that the Roman Empire, in its various, in its different variations, had existed for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the Sassanid Empire, in its various, in, in, in its variety, the Persian Empire had existed for hundreds and hundreds of years as well. And both of these empires, they had been at war with each other again and again and again and again. They had been clashing. Thus, the boundaries of both of these empires had been constantly moving. The boundaries of both of these empires had constantly been moving, but the reality was that both of these were considered to be powerful nations of their time. When cracks appeared in the palaces of both of the rulers of these empires, this was an indication. Those that were learned, those that had knowledge of the books, of the, peop- of the people of the past, they understood something very important. What is it that they understood? They realized that the empire, both of these empires are going to come to an end. Both of these empires are going to collapse and they're going to fall. They did not know what was going, who the fall was going to, where the fall was going to come from. But this was an indication that the fall was going to occur. Does anyone know what happened right after this, especially in the Persian Empire? Perhaps this, this, this one's a little bit tough, so maybe the kids won't know. Anyone know what happened right after the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi The leader of the Persian Empire, his son overthrows him. At first, his brother overthrows him. Then his son overthrows his brother, and then he assassinates all of them. What this does is essentially fragments the, it lays the foundation for the Persian Empire being fragmented later on. So although this wasn't visible just yet, although the fragmentation was not apparent just yet, many, many years later we'll see, especially when we talk about the Battle of uh, the Trench. Right? This is many, many years later, this is 50 some years later, that effects of that start to become visible. Okay, so the, 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 these two cracks appear initially. Another thing that happens is that there is a light that is seen. That there is in, in, all, in the southern part of Arabia, that is the Yemen area, the Yemen area, there is a light that appears. And the light that they see in the sky, it is pointing towards, yes, it is, meaning it's, it's, it's pointing towards Makkah. It's pointing directly towards Mecca. So then, the, the people that are in Yemen, especially remember, at this time, Yemen was primarily which religion? Anyone know? Not Jewish. Think, think Abraha. What religion was Abraha? Mustafa, go ahead. You get, say that again? He was Christian. Right, go ahead. You, you heard another one. Right, come on, guys. Mustafa is making you all look bad. Okay? Right, so he was he was Christian. The, the, the Yemen, primarily the southern part of the Arabian Peninsula, was Christian, and because of that, they had people that had studied the books. They had people that had studied the previous scriptures, and thus, when they saw this, they saw this. They realized what 
they realized that the last prophet was coming. And that is why, so that is why if you look at it, when the Prophet وسلم, sent emissaries many, many years later, when he sends Sahaba to go to Yemen, to the southern parts of Arabia, and call them towards Islam, was there wars that occurred? No. In fact, most of the people of Yemen, most of the people of southern Arabia, they accepted Islam as soon as the message reached them. As soon as the message reached them, they accepted Islam. Thus, the roots of Islam, you can find them, you can trace them back to the Yemen area from a very, very early stage. In fact, there are masajids that, there are masjids, masajids that exist in Yemen today that, that, whose foundations can be traced to the timeline of the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning, there were masajids that were established at the same time as the Prophet ﷺ was still alive. So you can see that, and this is based. This is based on. This is based on the religion that primarily. There's other religions as well, but the primary religion was of, of, of Christians at that time, and this was this was affected by Ethiopia. I remember Ethiopia and the southern part of Yemen. They're very close, and Ethiopia was Abyssin, Abyssinia was uh, Christian, and thus the southern part of uh, yeah, of Arabia, which is Yemen, was also Christian. But Soon after the birth of the Prophet uh, we know that he is, uh, just a few years later, the mother of the Prophet passes away as well, which we will get to in more detail. This brings up a very important aqidah question, a, a question of, um, a, 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 of debate. And that is that, what is the result? What, how, what do we look at when it comes to the parents of the Prophet because they were not alive when he received Nubuwa. They were not alive when he received prophethood. Right? They, were, they passed away many, many years before. So how do we address the issue about the parent of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Now, before I, before I share the next slide, it's very important for us to understand that this is, these, 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 are, these are legitimate opinions that exist amongst scholars. There's four opinions that exist. And I'll tell you what is the opinion that we should all extract and what is the opinion that we should all follow as well. The first and foremost is that they were on the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. One opinion is that they were on the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, meaning they were they were, they were, they were, they were Muslims. Right? They were Muslims in, in that in that regard, so thus they were uh, on the deen hanif. That's one opinion. Another opinion exists that they were from amongst the mushrikeen, they were from amongst the polytheists. They were from amongst the Mushrikeen. Now, this is an opinion that actually has hadith backing to it as well. Actually, both of these opinions, there are hadith that back these opinions. In fact, there's, an, there, there's a narration where one of, the, one of the people, one of the kuffar of Mecca, he comes to the Prophet وسلم, and he says, that, Do you, will you really abandon the religion of your father and my father? And the Prophet وسلم, responds to him and says, that your father and my father are both finnaq. They're both in Kaaba. This is a very strong narration. This is a narration that's actually in Bukhari. So that narration exists. So the second opinion is that of that they were Mushrikeen, they were polytheists. The third opinion is that they were neither polytheists, nor were they on the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but rather they just believed in the existence of one Allah. Meaning they weren't, pretty much, they weren't on the Deen Hanif, because the Deen Hanif, the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam, had been altered so much it had been disfigured so much that there really was no trace of it left anymore. But they did believe in the existence of one Allah. That was another opinion. And the fourth, and this is the opinion that we should all extract, and this is the opinion that we should all take as well. And that is tawakkuf. What is tawakkuf? Tawakkuf is holding ourselves back and not making a judgment call. What does that mean? That means that we will remain silent. We will remain silent on this because both sides of the opinion exist. And there are strong opinions and there's strong proofs for both sides. But because this is not a matter that's related to Imaniyat, this is not a matter related to our faith. Our faith is not affected by this. Right? If a person believes one way or, or the other, our faith is not affected by this. Our Iman is not affected by this. But out of the respect of the Prophet wasallam, we will remain silent on this. We will remain silent on this. Rather, we will say that Allah SWT knows best. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. Thus, we respect, we honor the parents of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because they are the parents of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
but we cannot say for certain they are one way or the other. Thus, we we extract the opinion that is of the wakuf, and that is the mainstream opinion of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jamaah. And we will say that we, we will remain silent on the 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 parents of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A question that comes up, and this is something that 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 brought up before as well. That Allah subhanahu wa taala has referred to the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as being pure and protected. How can a lineage be pure and protected if it has mushrikeen in it? Opinion number two. And I asked this question a few weeks ago as well. The answer to this is that protection of lineage does not mean that it was protected from shirk. Protection of lineage means that it was protected from what? Zina. That every child that was born in the from in the in the forefathers of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they were all born in wedlock. They were all born through marriage. None of them was born outside of marriage. That is what it means: protection of lineage. How do we know this? Because when you say the name of a person, who is the lineage established through? The father. And we know the fathers of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam all the way up. Thus, we know that the lineage of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is protected in that regard. That's what that means. Now let's talk a little bit about the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This we can categorize this into two different ways. The first is that there's some there's certain things about the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that there's no difference of opinion. No difference of opinion. What are those? Let's let's count out. There's three of those actually. What's one thing that is no difference of opinion on about related to the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Anyone know? Okay, all right. First and foremost was that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born on a Monday. No difference of opinion. Everyone agrees that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born on a Monday. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is that he was born in Mecca Mukarramah. No debate on that. No question about that. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in fact born in Mecca Mukarramah. And number three is that he was. There's really no legitimate different difference of opinion. Is that he was born in the year of the elephant, and that is the primary opinion as well. So the first categorization is of those things that there is no difference of opinion on is when the, when these three things, and that's about it. When the day that the Prophet ﷺ was born, that is Monday. The city that he was born in, that he was in Makkah, right? And then the year that he was born, and that was the year of the elephant. Everything else that's related to the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, that means talking about the exact location. The date uh, and even the month—that is all. There is some question. There is some debate regarding that as well. So let's start from the top. Which month was the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam born in? Go ahead. No month. Month. Yes. We don't know. Go ahead. Rabiul Awwal. Go ahead. Bali pa. Sorry, Mustafa. I don't think I can give you any more. Your dad's gonna. Throw me out of the window if I give you more lollipop at night time. <laughs> so maybe your brother. Okay. So yes, the first thing is first opinion is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born in Rabiul Awwal, and this is the majority opinion, and this is a strong opinion as well. But there is another opinion that exists. The other opinion is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was not born in Rabiul Awwal, but rather he was born in the month of Ramadan. Right. That's another opinion, but that is a uh, marjuh opinion. That is not a preponderant opinion. So Rabbi Allah, that's the first. The second is, what about the date of the birth? What was the date that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born on? This is someone. This is a question that there's actually multiple narration uh, regarding this, and we'll see where that comes from as well. So, what was the date of the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Go ahead. No, no, date and not the year, not year, and not the Gregorian. It's good five, good twelve. The date, as in like you know, one, two, three, four, like that, like that. No, no, not like twenty-two, like twenty, like twenty-two January. Okay. Uh, who's the artist? Go ahead, artist. You have a chance for this. Twelfth is one of the dates. Yes, twelfth is one of the dates. But that is not the most. That's not the strongest date, by the way. Okay, from based on proofs, based on uh, you're welcome. Right, based on proofs and based on. Of um, you know, Thugut, that is not the strongest opinion. What is the other opinion? Anyone know? Sorry, nine as well. 
Lollipop, but okay. <laughs> Nine is another one. What's another one? Let's, let's, let's do one more. Okay. There's no 71 days in, in a year, my friend. In a month, my friend. So good try. Go ahead. 30 days in each month, but that's not one of the days. Okay? Yes. There are multiple dates. There are multiple dates regarding the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. There is narration that says that he was born on the 2nd of Rabbi Lawal. There is narration that says that he was born on the 9th. Others that say 10th, some say 17th, some say 12th, some say 17th, and some say 22nd. There is many narrations regarding this. Now, what is the most famous one? And that is the 12th. That's the one that became famous. Right, it became famous that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born on the uh, on the uh, cult of Rabi Lawal. That's the most famous one, but that is not the most authentic one. The most authentic opinion is that he was born actually on the ninth of Rabi Lawal. The most authentic opinion is that he was born on the ninth, but it was the 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 one that sort of became famous was that he was born on the twelfth of Rabi Lawal. Anyone know why the twelfth of Rabi Lawal became famous? That's actually the date of his passing. That is actually the date of the passing of the Prophet ﷺ. So people assume that the passing and the birth of the Prophet ﷺ happened on the same day. That is one opinion, but the passing of the Prophet ﷺ occurred on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. And that's where sort of the, 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 the question comes to be. Now, where was a, where is the, what is the location of the Prophet ﷺ's birth? As we know, it was in Makkah Mukarramah. The city is Makkah. Where was some suggestion? Some suggest that there was a house near Mount Safa. I remember when you're doing Sa'i, it's between Safa to Marwa and Safa, right? And so some suggest there was a house near Safa. That's where he was born. Others suggest it was a house in the neighborhood of Banu Hashim. Where was the neighborhood of Banu Hashim? The neighborhood of Banu Hashim was on the right side of Marwa. So you have Safa, and you have Marwa, and the neighborhood of Banu Hashim was towards the right side of of, um, of Marwa. So if you look at it from a modern sort of geographical uh, place, that is, this is an older image, this is an older satellite image, that that is roughly the place where the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's the area that the birth, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was born. So you can see, where is Safa? Where is Safa? Safa is that dome on the bottom. Right? That dome, that little, that round um, on the middle of the screen, the round, brown dome, that's the Safa. Marwa is up top. So the, the neighborhood of Banu Hashim was to the right of, of Marwa, and that's where roughly, roughly in, in that area. This is a picture of it, what it used to look like a few years ago. Right? What it used to look like a few years ago, if you look to the top left, if you look to the top left, what do you see? You see that that is the entrance of the Haram. That's the Masjid al-Haram. You can see uh, the, the walkway into Marwa that's, that, that's there as well. And that's that, that little, uh, that little, ba- that little uh, building you see, that was the house where the Prophet ﷺ was born. It was demolished and then there was a library was built. Then it was demolished again and another building was built in that uh, location. In fact, there was a time where there was a Masjid that used to exist. If you look at some of the older pictures, if you look at some of the very old pictures, this is a picture that you can find in the library of... Um, Princeton University. Princeton University's library has this. If you look at the bottom, in the writing, it's handwritten. What does it say? Maudi al walad al nabawi al sharif. That is the the space of the uh, of the wilada, the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, and there is, you see that there's a little dome there as well, meaning that there was a masjid that was there. There's a masjid that existed, but that masjid was demolished. Right, that masjid was demolished in the 1950s. A masjid was demolished in the 1950s, and then a, um, a, uh, a book, a, so a library was built in that spot, and then that library was demolished, and then a, another structure was built, a small little, um, uh, like a, uh, it, 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 it was dealing with books and like pamphlets and that kind of stuff, and then I believe that has been demolished once again. Last, this is a picture that was taken from the last time that the, uh, uh, Last time it was seen upright. No, it's it, it, from the latest um, discovery. It does not look like it's, it seems it does not seem to be a, there anymore. And if you can see, it's been blocked off a little bit from the sides over there as well, so that you, you can't really enter it anymore. But that's where the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam took place. That area in Makkah, Mukarramah. Now, 
a question that comes up, and this is something that's, that's brought up many times as well, is that is it permissible to celebrate the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Now, this is, a, this is an important question that we need to all understand because this is a there's a reason why there's very very strong opinions that exist on both sides, and let's understand why those exist as well. On one side, you have you have a group that suggests that celebrating the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is a must that every believer should do. If a person does not do it, they are wrong. They do not love the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They are what we call gustafi rasul. Right, they are. They, they have uh, dishonored the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's one extreme. You have another extreme that say that completely celebrating the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is haram. Anyone that does it, they are they are a mubtadi, meaning they are a, they are committing bid'ah, and they are no longer. Some even say that they are no longer in the folds of Islam anymore. Extremes. It's important to understand where these extremes came from. Where these extremes came from. The, where, the, the origin of these extremes is that the birth of the Prophet ﷺ was not celebrated in the earlier days of Islam. Right? Birthdays was not something that were celebrated generally. But especially the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, it was not celebrated early on. What ended up happening was that as the years progressed, as the years progressed, some of the ulama, they saw that the people were getting more and more distance from the Prophet ﷺ. Thus, they began to formulate that maybe we should do something to reconnect everyone to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they started to hold these gatherings, what we would call the Mawlid or the Milad, where they would come together, where they would recite salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they would talk and they would learn about the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a similar fashion like we're doing today. That's where it began. But what ended up happening was that as the years progressed, as the years progressed, people start to add more and more things into it. As that practice began to go into different parts of the Muslim world, people start to add different practices to it. People start to add, okay, you have to have food into it. Not just food. Now you have to have specific food into it. You have to, set, you have to decorate the area. Not just decorate, you have to decorate in a particular way. And then, now let's specify a date. Right? Before, originally when it started, there was no specified date. In fact, the molas used to occur weekly. The molas in the earlier days used to occur weekly, on a weekly basis. So there was no specified date. But then they said, no, no, let's specify a date. And what was the date that was specified? The 12th. And that's where the birth date of the Prophet ﷺ being the 12th became famous as well. And started to spread from that regard as well. So when this started to happen, what ended up happening is, the belief, the creed, the aqidah of some individuals started to become distorted. They started to become distorted. As happens with anything, when we go into gulu, when we go in too far in one direction, what ends up happening is that the aqidah, the belief, if they're not grounded, especially when it comes to, and it's not being managed by ulama, people end up falling prey to this. So what ends up happening is that people's aqidah starts to get messed up. They start to attribute God-like qualities to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They start to attribute the qualities of being present everywhere to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They start attributing uh, qualities like uh, that he was not a human, he was made of light. Right? To the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, what ends up happening is that a correction occurs. A correction occurs. The ulama, they see that this is happening. So what do they do? They say, people should not celebrate the mawlid at all. At all. They, they say that because this is leading to the, the corruption of aqidah, people should not celebrate the mawlid at all. That's where the correction becomes. And when the correction occurs, initially, whenever you want to correct something, what do you have to do? You have to correct their heart. And you have to correct it. Different, you have to go really on the extreme side in order to correct and to bring the scale back into the middle. But when the overcorrection occurred, when the overcorrection occurred, it occurred too fast and it ended up becoming widespread in that way as well. Where people started to take the stance that uh, 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 any sort of gathering that holds these sorts of um, so they, they, that resemble these are completely prohibited. And that's where the two factions came to be. The ulama, they sort of stood in the middle. But the a faction amongst the, amongst the, uh, the army, amongst the, the regular folks, it started to spread. And then even from amongst them, they started to raise ulama that stuck by their guts on these as well. And that's why if you look, if you go in certain countries, if you go to certain areas in the Muslim world, you will find one stance and others you will find the opposite stance. 
And that's where that sort of comes from. So, let's understand a nuance, or let's understand a real approach of what it is. First and foremost, can we call the celebrating the Mawlid the, uh, a sunnah of the Prophet We cannot. We cannot call it a sunnah. Can we call it something that is mandatory? Absolutely not. We cannot call it something that's mandatory. At most, at most we can call it something that is beneficial. That's the most that we can call it. The least we can call it is haram, as we'll see why. There's a few things to keep in mind. If these are abided by, if these are adhered to, then inshallah it should be okay. Let's use our guiding principle, and that is the statement of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, لا طاعة لبشر في معصية الله That there is no obedience of a bashar, of a human, in the disobedience of Allah. Meaning, as soon as we start to disobey Allah in order to celebrate the messenger of Allah, we've crossed the line. That means we have gone beyond the limits. If the celebration of the, of the, of the Prophet wasallam crosses the hudud that has been set by Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has set hudud that you cannot do this, 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 this. As soon as we cross those, in order to celebrate the messenger of Allah, we know that we are going against the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself. So in order to understand this, let's say, it would be permissible, it would be permissible to celebrate the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning it would be permissible to celebrate the moment of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if certain criteria is met. Number one, that there are no impermissible actions that exist in the gathering. Meaning it's not, it is not a mixed gathering, it is, it is not a gathering where everyone's like, um, you know, coming together, and it's like a kumbaya circle. That's not, that's not what it's supposed to be. Okay, there has to be some, the rules of the sharia have to be taken into precedence. There cannot be any music. There cannot be any sort of um, haram actions that are done. Anything that is considered haram outside, they cannot be allowed within. That's the first and foremost thing to understand. The second thing is that the non-participants are not to be frowned upon or rebuked at all. If someone chooses not to sit in a maulid, we cannot tell that person you are doing something that's incorrect. As soon as someone says that, as soon as someone believes that, as soon as someone feels that way, that maulid is no longer permissible anymore. Because now we've crossed into, we've crossed the line once again. So, we can say, if you want to attend, Bismillah. If you don't want to attend, Bismillah. No, nothing wrong with that. But as soon as we say, if you're not participating, you don't love the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we've crossed the khulud once again. The third thing is that issues of aqidah and belief have to be in line with Ahlul Sunnah. We ha they have to be in line with Ahlul Sunnah. Meaning, if a person believes that if I am reciting salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is physically here, or he, he manifests in the gathering, that means that this mawlid is no longer permissible once again. Why? Because aqidah issues are being messed up now. Belief systems are being corrupted now. This is why, if you go to a mawlid, and people sometimes, they will stand in a mawlid. Right? Anyone know why they stand? Now this is important. This is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is important. Because you have to figure out why people are standing. If they are standing out of respect, just respect and nothing else, no harm in that. They just respect, because they're saying we're reciting salawat, we're studying durud, so we were standing in respect for that, no harm, no foul in that. But if they are standing, why? Because they believe that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is there, now it becomes impermissible. That is when it becomes impermissible. Okay? That's the third thing. So aqidah issues have to be clarified. Aqidah issues have to be taught. This is why you have to be careful on when you go about doing it. A third thing, oh sorry, fourth thing, is that a specific day cannot be singled out over other days. A specific day cannot be singled out over other days because once again, now we are introducing something that does not exist, that does not belong in the study. So if we say we are only going to do it on the 12th of Rabi al awwal now once again, we have crossed the line once again. And the last thing is cut off over there, and that is that there has to be some sort of benefit to it as well. Meaning you're learning the sirah, you're reciting salawat, Right? There has to be some benefit to it as well. If these guidelines are adhered to, if these guidelines are followed, then there is, then it is permissible, and at most we can say it will be beneficial. But can we say it's sunnah? Absolutely not. 
right? This is, this is a really important point, a very important point that we must understand in order to, uh, in regards to the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now it comes to, after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is born, what is the sunnah of when someone is born, what do you do? You do an aqiqa, right? There's an aqiqa that, is, that, that should be done. And this actually occurred for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. The aqiqa of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam occurred on the seventh day after the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he slaughtered an animal, he slaughtered an animal, and he held a feast for Quraysh. He held a feast for Quraysh. Okay. I think you just have to zoom out a little bit. That's all it is. Okay, that's fine. Okay. But yeah. So, the, the Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he held a feast for Quraysh, and that is where the beginnings of Afika are. And that's why when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam became a prophet as well, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam held on to that. And he established that as well as being part of his sunnah. And now it is on that day that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was named Muhammad. And that is why the sunnah of naming, the, naming your child, it is sunnah to name your child on the seventh day. That's why it's, it's sunnah to name the child on the seventh day. Now, typically it's difficult for us to do it here because we have to sign paperwork and whatnot at the hospital, right? Um, otherwise, just, yeah, what, is the, what is the default name? Um, I forget what the default name is. Otherwise, they give, oh yeah, they say baby boy. That's it. Baby boy or ba- baby girl. So, but it is sunnah to, uh, uh, to God, give the name on the seventh day. But the way that we can still abide by the sunnah is that you can give, you can decide on the name beforehand, you can write it on the paperwork, but then announce it on the seventh day. Announce it on the seventh day. That, that, in that way, we can fulfill the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as well. In the early days, in the early childhood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his mother Amina, she fed him milk for only a few days. She only fed, fed, fed milk to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for a few days. And after that, the Wayba. The servant of Abu Lahab, she fed him milk after that. Suwayba was the woman that came to Abu Lahab. Remember Abu Lahab? He was the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ. He was the brother of the Prophet ﷺ's father. So, Suwayba was, uh, she was the one that came to Abu Lahab and informed him that your, you have a, um, a, 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 your son, sorry, your brother Abdullah has had a son. And he became so happy that he freed Suwayba. He freed Suwayba, and Suwayba then went in the service of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and she fed him milk as well. After that, Halima Sa'adiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, she nursed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Now, what was the custom of, of, of that time? The custom of the time was that, especially those that were the noble people that of, of noble families, noble descent, noble families, they wanted to make sure that their children were protected from two things. What were those two things that they wanted to protect their babies from? You wanna know? Why they would send them out. Sickness, I'm sorry, I can't give you another one. Your dad's gonna <laughs> what else? sickness and what else? Go ahead, Amagan. Okay? Culture and language. Good. You can get it now or later. So, culture, that's part, part of that is language. And the second was the sickness. Remember, Makkah was, we looked at the, the, the map that we looked at last class, is that Makkah was on the trading route between Yemen and Syria. As well as, from Ethiopia, there would be caravans that would come, they would cross the sea, and then they would, they would cross the, uh, the narrow sea there, and they would go all the way up to Syria from Mecca. And Mecca was situated in there. What happens in a city like that? What happens in a city like that? There is many different people that are coming from different parts of the world. Thus, there is going to be disease. There is going to be disease that comes with that as well. On top of the disease, there is the language gets altered. A perfect example of this is, you go to New York. Right? I remember in 8th grade, uh, in 8th grade I had, a, I had a, my language arts teacher, Mrs. Rogers. Right? This is, that's her actual, actual name. And Mrs. Rogers is my 8th grade teacher in English, my language arts. And she was from Brooklyn. She was from Brooklyn right? So she, when she used to pronounce her name, she would say, I'm Mrs. Rogers. 
right? Mrs. Woods. So I remember when my mom went for my parent-teacher conference, right? My mom, you know, she, she doesn't speak English that well, but she can understand it. So when she went and she, you know, met uh, Mrs. Rogers and stuff, she came home and she's like, yeah, you know, Mrs. Miss, Mrs. Rogers with a W, right, was saying this, this, this about you. So when she was writing a letter, she wrote it with W-L-D-G-E-R-S. Because that's how she spoke. And there's a lot of times when she would teach us, we wouldn't understand some words that she was saying because it's not that she was speaking another language, it was English, right? But it was, it, it was that because she was from Brooklyn, because, you know, the, the, uh, and a big city, the, the, the accent gets altered as well. Same thing would happen in Makkah. Same exact thing would happen in Makkah. Perfect example of this is going anywhere in the Arab world today. I go into anywhere in the Arab world, any uh, part of the Arab world today. Every place has its unique, unique way of see, saying things. For example, I'll give you an example. Umar, I'm going to call you, put you on the spot real quick. All right? Umar, what do you call this? This building? In, in Arabic. Ghana. Is there a gas in Arabic? Is there a gas sound in Arabic? Let me ask him. In the alphabet letter, Alif, Ba, Ta, Ta, Jim, Ha, Ha, Da, Da, Ra, Da. Is there anywhere where you say Ja? No, you don't. And that's a Jim. What he's saying is Jamia. What he's actually saying is Jamia. Right? Jamia in Egyptian Arabic is Jama. Right? There's a Ga there. So that's, that's an alteration of the language. Right? This is not just in, uh, for Egyptian, this is uh, all, all the, uh, anywhere, anywhere there, the, the language gets altered. That was the exact same case that was happening in Makkah Mukarramah. And so the, the people that used to have, especially those that were wealthy, when they, were, when they would have babies, they would send them out into the Bedouin area. They would send them out amongst, to live amongst the Bedouins, so that number one, they were free from all the disease. They were free from all of that, and on top of that, they learned language in a pure form. They learn language, they learn language in its purest form. And that's why you see that the language that they spoke and the language that they knew was Fusha. Right? It was very, very eloquent. But when they, when they and, and that's why you, you find, but there are some uh, Sahaba, they would say words. And you find those words in a hadith as well. And you wonder, you're like, I'm looking this up in the dictionary, I don't find it anywhere in the dictionary. Where is this coming from? That's an alteration of the language. And that happens. That happens in bigger cities. So the two reasons that people would send their children out was number one, they wanted to be, them to be away from pollution. That's you know all sorts of pollution, as well as they wanted them to learn pure Arabic. And typically, the way that this would work is that when babies were born, the mothers would take their babies, and they were and the, and and the people, the Bedouins, they would come every so often. The Bedouins would come and they would look at the babies and they would pick and they would say, okay, I'm going to take this baby. And I'm going to go and nurse the baby for X amount of time. Sometimes it will be a few months. Sometimes it will be a few years. But they will take the babies from the mothers for, for, for the initial few years. Now, what the payment used to be was that they wouldn't get paid up front. The payment was that when they would return the child, right? for example, a baby is born, a, a wet nurse comes. She takes the baby and nurses the baby for X amount of months, or X amount of years. When she returns the baby, then the family of the baby takes care of her and they provide her with wealth and money and whatnot. If the child has no family, particularly if the child has no father, then it becomes problematic. Then, because the babies, the, 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 the women that are coming to take these children, they say that there's nothing, there's nothing to gain, for me to gain from this. I think that's their work. That's the way they earn their money. There's nothing for me to earn from this. So how, why would I take this child? And that is exactly how, what happened with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Women are coming and Amina is holding. And as some of you say it was Amina, as I say it was Suwayba. They're holding. They're holding the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they come and they look at the baby. They see it as a beautiful baby. They recognize there's something special about the baby. They're like, where's his father? He's a yeti. He's an awesome pass. One by one. One by one. Every single woman, every single wet nurse comes. She, she goes home with a different baby and there's left is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad bin Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is left behind. No one, wants, no one wants this child because the child does not have a father. Halima Sa'adiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, she comes at the end of the path. 
Why? Because her camel was weak. She had some narrations say she had a camel, others say her she had a mule. But the thing, the manual that she was riding on was weak, so she was be- behind the whole group. So she gets there as she's getting there. Her companions are telling her there's nothing left. There's nothing left except there's this one orphan. That's all there is. Halima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she goes and she looks at the baby and she realizes she's recognizing that there's something special about this baby, something special about him. But where's the father? The father passed away before, before even he was born. Before even he was born, the father had already passed away. So she was reluctant. She was reluctant, but in her mind, later in her mind, she said that why not just let me take, let, let, let me not go back home empty-handed. Let me take, at least take someone. Let me take at least someone. So she takes Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when she grabs the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she sees the barakat, the blessings, immediately have an effect on everything that's around her. One thing to keep in mind is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even before when he was, a, even before prophethood, there is tabarru, there is, there, there is barakah, there is blessings with everything that was related to him. Everything that's connected to him. Thus, if you ever wonder why do people, you know, why when you go to Istanbul, or if you go, if you go to, uh, in Turkey, you will find the blessed hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam there. And you will see why do people honor the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We, ha- we, we were, we hosted the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this masjid, a few years back, if you, rem- uh, you, may, ha- you may remember. So why do people honor the hair of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? It's just hair. Why do people honor the bowl of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? When in Chechnya, Chechnya uh, the, there was a, fa- there, there was a, uh, a family that, uh, in Chechnya that held a bowl that belonged to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he used to drink from for hundreds and hundreds of years. But then when the British came and they took it, they, they stole it. And then when it was closed down the entire country, <coughs> and they welcomed what? The bowl <coughs> of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You can find videos of it online. You find videos of it online, they're welcoming the bowl of the Prophet Why was that? Why do we do that? Because everything that is connected to the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa it has a barakah to it, it has a blessing that's attached to it. Halima Sa'adiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, she sees this firsthand. What happens? She takes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and as soon as he starts to go back, she, what ends up happening is that She's able to nurse not just Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but she's able to nurse her own baby as well. She was weak; she didn't have food. In order for a mother to be able to nurse, she needs to be, she needs to eat, and she needs to eat uh, well. Otherwise, she has a very difficult time being able to nurse. So suddenly, she has milk to feed not just one child but both children. On top of that, the the the, the, the animal that she's on suddenly it's faster than anyone else. The camels that they had back at home, they are full of milk. The goats that they had back home, they are full of milk. The land that they were killing, that they were farming on, suddenly, in just a very short span of time, it's starting to sprout. And she recognizes, what's the one thing that has changed? She recognizes this. Right, this is what Allah SWT talks about, that ayat, right, signs, that li ulil absar, ulil absar, for the people that have eyes. Who are the people that have eyes? It's not the people that have eyes, it's the eyes of the heart. That people are able to recognize these things. So she recognizes what's the one differentiating factor between before this and now? That this baby came into my life. This baby came into my life. And she enjoys this. She enjoys this time for two full years. And that was her initial contract. She enjoys two full years of nursing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and seeing the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam grow up in front of her. And thus, the, the, her uh, the, her children, because they were nursed by the same mother, they become the foster children, foster brothers and sisters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as well. After two years, two years is over. She goes. Back, she takes the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam back, and she requests Amina that I would want, I want the baby again. Let me take him for a little bit longer, because she knew that she saw what had happened. She saw what was occurring. 
She saw all the things that are happening around her home. She saw what's happening in, in her home. And she says, I don't want to get rid of this. I don't want to lose this. So she begged me, I mean, let me, give me an extension. Let me take Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Amina reluctantly agrees. The mother of the Prophet Sallallahu reluctantly agrees. And Halima radiallahu ta'ala anha, she takes the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam back. But this time, she only takes him back for a very short period. Although the contract was for much longer, she only, this time she only takes him back for a short period of time. And we'll learn why later on. So we talked about why raised, why, why raised uh, amongst the Bedouins, because two reasons, number one, away from pollution, and second was to learn pure Arabic. Now let's, let's briefly go over who Halima radiallahu ta'ala anha was as well. Her name is Halima bint Abu Zu'ayn. She was the third nurse, third person to nurse the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning, the first was who? Amina. The second was? Suwaiba. And the third was? Halima radiallahu alayhi She was the third person to uh, nurse the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she developed a foster relationship with the Prophet and her children. Meaning, in Islam, when a child, when two unrelated children, they drink as long as they're under the age of two. They drink from the same mother. Then they become nahram for each other. Meaning they cannot marry each other anymore. Right? And this is something that we have to be very mindful of. Sometimes there's, there's carelessness that takes place and it can cause problems later on. I'll tell you a case scenario, case study that occurred not too long ago. Where? There's a family. There, there, there was a family, that, they were family friends. They used to live together a long, long time ago. When they all immigrated together to America, they used to live together. And when they lived together, you know, one of them had a, one, one of them had a, a, a child. And they had a child and the mother, you know, they, they, they were a little bit careless in who fed, nursed the child, meaning from themselves. Well, fast forward 25, 30 years. Their family friends, okay, let's get this child married to this child. They get married. They have children. They have a few children. And they find out later on that they're both, the husband and the wife, had been fed milk from the same mother. That Nikah never took place. That Nikah was in, invalid from the, very, from the get-go because it was as if they were brother and sister. This is something we have to be very, very careful about. Something that we have to be very mindful of, of mindful about as well. So when the, when the relationship of Raba, when the relationship of foster or nursing occurs, make sure you either write it down or inform someone so that it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it's known that so-and-so and so-and-so are Rabai brothers and sisters. Otherwise, it can cause many, many problems uh, later on. This is not just one case scenario. When I, this case was brought to me, so I, first I was just, baffled a little bit, so then I uh, uh, relegated it to my, my elders and my teachers, and they said that, oh, this isn't the first time that we've heard of this. This has happened before as well. So something to be mindful about. Anyway, so because of that, she had, she had children. Halima radiallahu ta'ala had children, and thus uh, her children became the foster brother and sister of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now there is a little bit of a difference of opinion of whether she accepted Islam or not, right? Ibn uh, al-Qayyim al-Tullahi alayhi wa sallam, as we, we talked about what tawakkuf was, he remained silent. But there is, there is strong indication that she was a Muslim. She did accept Islam. What is that strong indication? Is that after the Battle of Hunayn took place, after the Battle of Hunayn took, uh, took place, there is a woman by the name of Shayma bint al harith that comes and uh, that, 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 the, that the Prophet Islam is informed about that she had been captured in, that, in the Battle of Hunayn. And the Prophet Islam recognizes that Shema, that is the daughter of Halima, meaning that is his foster sister. Some say Shema, another way to pronounce it is Shema. But both of those are uh, correct pronunciations. So when he hears about this, he wants her to be free. And in fact, the narration says that the Prophet Islam was, when he saw her coming, he took off the straw that he was wearing and he laid it on the ground for her to sit on. And when she comes and she sits on the straw, he starts to talk to her and he asks, what happened to my mother, what happened to my father? Ya Allah. Can you imagine this? He doesn't know. And Shema, she expresses to the Prophet that they have both passed away. 
they had both passes. But he does indicate to the Prophet that they did accept Islam, meaning at least Halima radiallahu she did accept Islam before uh, be, be, before passing away. And thus, another big indication of this is that she is buried in Baqi. That's her grave. In Baqi, in Jantul Baqi or Baqi al Gharpad in Madinah Munawwarah, that was a graveyard for the Muslims. That was a graveyard exclusively for the Muslims. So if someone was buried there, that is a very strong indication that she was a Muslim as well. That's why we can say, anha. Although, whether we can say she is a Sahabiya or not, that's a little bit questionable. Because although she did accept Islam, she did not see the Prophet in a state of Iman. For in order for someone to become a Sahabi, what are the conditions? Maktab guys, you guys should definitely know this. For in order for someone to be a Sahabi, what are the conditions? Right? Number one, you have to be a Muslim. You have to have seen the Prophet while in a state of being Muslim. And what's the third one? You have to have you have to pass away in the state of being Muslim as well. Those are the three conditions. So out of these, we can say the first and the third conditions apply, but the second one I do not believe that applies for uh, for her. There's some indication that say that she was in the crowd that uh, in Hajjat al Wida. There's some suggestions that, that she was in the crowd when the Prophet ﷺ was giving uh, the uh, the farewell speech of the Hajj, but that the, 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 that timeline doesn't make sense. The timeline is a little bit shaky there. And this is a this is the area. This is in uh, in uh, the, the Hawazin area, and this is where the Prophet ﷺ, This is the house of Halima Saadia radiallahu anha. So you can see that the walls were there, the semi-roof there, and that's basically where they used to, that's where, that is where they used to live. Do you notice something in there? Do you notice something in that, in, that, in, that, in this picture? Right? The small little patch of grass. What is that small little patch of grass? This is, this is, why I, this is the re- main reason why I included this picture. What is that? Go ahead, Amit. No, that's not a grave. Go ahead, Moish. Okay? Now, the Zanamaz is on this side, right? But on the top right, there's a small little patch of grass. What is that? Can anyone take a guess? The Prophet is to speak there. That is the area, and Shema bint al Harith had made this, uh, is the one that suggested this, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used when he was, he said that when they used to be a baby, when he used to be a baby, this is the area that he used to sleep, and this is an area that's always had grass, it's never dried out, and we don't water it. Unfortunately, this area was demolished in 1950s as well, right? This area had, uh, by the, uh, the, the government, it was demolished as well, and then, uh, not in the 1950s, later on. It was in the, it was later on, but this area was demolished as well, and that's, now if you go there, there's nothing there. There's nothing there except a small little plaque uh, that just suggests that this was where what, what, what something used to be, but there's nothing else left as well. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> do we want to stop or do we want to continue? Stop or continue? Right? Five more minutes. Okay. All right, inshallah. So let's talk about why did Halima radiallahu ta'ala anha return the Prophet sallallahu to his mother? What's the reason? I owe you a lot of stuff like that. Right. Now imagine this. Imagine this. You know, we, we I ask the people that take care of kids, right? Maktab and Muslim and whatnot. <laughs> you have to be very careful with the kids, especially if it's not your own kids. If your own kids is not a big deal. Right? Imagine this. You're teaching a class, or you have, you're, you're babysitting, and your kid comes running into the home and says, Baba, Baba, Mama, Mama, our brother over there, or so and so, someone came, threw him on the ground, cut his chest open. Right. What would you think at that moment? What would you do at that moment? <laughs> That's exactly what happened. The splitting of the chest of the Prophet ﷺ. The splitting of the chest was a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ that occurred even before his prophethood. 
the splitting of the chest, when that occurred in the presence of Halima Tabiya radiyata anha, meaning that occurred in the house of her, in her house, she was taken aback. She realized, okay, this is, this is dangerous. This is something, something is happening over here. I don't want to be. I, I don't, I, I'm scared. Because what happens is that her, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is playing out with her son and with her daughter. And suddenly her son runs back and he says, Our Hashimi brother, someone came and I threw our Hashimi brother on the ground. He cut his chest open, took his heart out, and then put it back in. Remember, this is out in the desert. This is out in the Bedouins. This is something that could have happened. Halima radiallahu she runs to go and see what's happening. And she sees the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's fine. But his face, is, the color of his face is completely changed. Something's completely altered. And that's when she decides that, you know what? I'm going to go and return him back to his mother. Now, the splitting of the chest. The splitting of the chest. Let's briefly talk about that. The splitting of the chest of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa occurred four times. It wasn't just once. It was four times. The first time was when, when he was in the house of Halima Sa'adiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he was roughly four years old. Some say he was a little bit younger, but he was roughly four years old. Some say he was around three years old. That when it occurred in the house of Halima Sa'adiyah radiallahu ta'ala anha, when his chest was split open. The second time was when he was about ten years old. And we'll talk about why that was, why the number 10 later on as well. Then it occurred again. His, he was, he was, uh, his, uh, his chest was cut open, and he, at, at the time of him receiving nubuwa, receiving prophethood, and the fourth was when he was taken on Mi'raj. So the Prophet sallallahu splitting of the chest occurred four times, not just once. And each of these times was for a specific reason. What was it? Each of these times it occurred right before when something monumental was about to happen in his life. Something huge was about to occur in his life. And when something huge was about to occur in his life, what, was that, what would happen? Angel Zibril would come, he would open his chest, and he would take out any portion that the shaitan could affect him from his heart and remove it. Why? At, at four years old, what happened right after this? There was something big that was about to happen in the life of the Prophet Sorry? His mother passed away. When someone passes away, when someone passes away, that was when, that is the one of the especially someone that is very close to you. That is one of the most vulnerable positions that a person can be in, and that is why, the, you know, if we look at the industries that exist in our in our country, what is the, one of the most profitable industries in this in this country? It is the death industry. Go, go try to find how much a grave costs. Go try to find how much a casket costs. All these things are very, very expensive. Why? Because people are vulnerable and people will take advantage of that. And shaitan can take advantage of a person at that time as well. Good, good religious folks, people who are inclined to the deed, they are in tune with the deed. Even they will fall and they will make mistakes when it comes to this time. They'll make mistakes. They'll do bid'ah. They'll do things that are against their religion. They'll do things that are haram even. Because it's a very vulnerable time. And that's the share of shaitan. What happened at the age? What, what was about to happen when he was around 10 years old? Some say it was a little bit earlier. Anyone know? Go ahead, Arif. His grandfather passes away. Right around that time, his grandfather passes away as well. That's once again a huge thing. Because think about what's happening. The Prophet ﷺ is born. He is born, and what happens? He is born without a father. He's very young. What happens? The only parent that he knows passes away. Then, just a few years later, now the only parent he knows, that's his grandparent, passes away. Can you imagine the difficulty? Can you imagine the vulnerable state? He's a human being at, at, at the end of the day. Right? He's a human being at the end of the day. He's a human that feels. He's a human that, that, that goes through the motions. Imagine the state that the Prophet ﷺ would have been in at that time. Thus, this happened. And then, when we time it, we talk about Nubuwa, that's obviously prophethood. Receiving prophethood. And lastly, Mi'raj. That is why. Because why? Because he was about to go and converse with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To talk to Allah Azza wa that is a monumental task. That is something that is very heavy. So in order for him to be able to do that, he had to be 
pure side. There's some narrations regarding this as well. Let's read the narration as well. عن أنس بن مالك رضي الله تعالى عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أتاه جبريل صلى الله عليه وسلم. Right? Anas bin Malik رضي الله تعالى عنه says that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said that Jibreel came to him وهو يلعب يلعب مع الغلمان while he was playing with the children. فأخذه he grabbed him فصرعه he threw him on the ground فشق عن قلبه he ripped open his chest and took out his heart فاستخرج القلب he took out his heart. فَاسْتَخْرَجَ مِنْهُ عَلَقَةً And he took out a piece, a clot from his heart as well. وَقَالْ هَذَا حَظُّ الشَّيْطَانِ مِنْكَ This is the part that was, this is the part that the shaitan could have influenced to you. This is the part of you that shaitan could have had influence on you. ثُمَّ غَسَلَهُ فِي طَسْتٍ مِنْ ذَهَبٍ Then he washed his heart in a bowl, in a goblet, مِنْ ذَهَبٍ That was made of gold, بِمَاءِ زَمْزَمْ With the water of زَمْزَمْ ثم لامه ثم عاده then he put it back and he he returned him back to where he was. وجاء الفلمان this is the narration. وجاء الفلمان يسعون إلى أمه the 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 children they ran to their mother. فقالوا إن محمد قد قتل. Oh mother, oh mother, Muhammad has been killed. Muhammad has been killed because that's all they're seeing. They're seeing some some being, something come and throw him on the ground and cut open his heart. فَاسْتَقْبَلُوهُ وَهُوَ مُنْتَقَعُ اللَّوْمِ They go to him and they find him that his change, his color has been completely changed. And Anas رضي الله تعالى said, Anas قال Anas, Anas رضي الله تعالى said, وَقَدْ كُنْتُ أَرَى أَسَرَ ذَلِكَ الْمِخْيَةَ فِي صَدْرِهِ He said, I saw the effect of this on the chest of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Meaning, I could see where it occurred. On the chest of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Meaning when he saw the bare chest of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he was able to see this is where this occurred. Now we're under off with this. Well, why did this have to occur? There's a few reasons. Now first and foremost, it was purification. The literal was that it was the removal of the black cloth, the dark cloth that was inside of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi heart. And that was the Havdu Shaitan. The second was, it was a figurative. So there was two washings that occurred. Number one was a literal, and number two was a figurative. So he received both of them, right? Just like when we do our when we do our uh, wudu. Have you ever thought about it? When we're doing wudu, how is wudu purifying us? How is wudu purifying us? If we were really wanting to be purified, we'd wash all of our legs, all of our arms, our chest, all of that. But no, wudu is meant to be a spiritual, a figurative purification. Thus, the heart of the Prophet ﷺ was literally purified by the removal of the cloth and figuratively and spiritually purified as well by washing with the water of Zamzam. And the reason it happened was for two, for two main reasons. One was to show and to establish the innocence of the Prophet ﷺ, and this is an aqidah point, an important point for us to remember, and that is the ismat of Rasulullah ﷺ. Ismat of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that means that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is ma'asum, that he cannot commit a sin. It's not that he won't, he cannot commit a sin. And this is the aqeed of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that all the Prophets are ma'asum, they cannot commit sin. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that it shows the limits of human intellect. How? How does it show the, intellect, uh, the limits of human intellect? By our understanding, there's a couple of doctors here. If someone comes and does open heart surgery on a child in the middle of the desert, what are we going to say? Impossible. I don't understand it. This doesn't make any sense. But what is the deen teaching us? What is the uh, what are the ahadith teaching us? That our intellect is limited. Our intellect is limited. Our intellect says that this cannot have, this could this is something that could not have occurred. Yet it did occur. Yet we know that it occurred. So it shows us that our intellect, our mind only has it, has, it has a ceiling. It cannot go above that. Our mind, it can understand up to a certain point, it cannot go beyond that. And that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us in this as well. This is the beauty of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Every single aspect of his life, even before Nubuwa, there's lessons in it for us. There's things that we can learn from it. There's things that are applicable to us. That's why when someone says, oh, the Prophet ﷺ just did this because it was a custom, it is a completely false equivalent. How can we say that the Prophet ﷺ did this just it was because it was a custom? How can, how can we say that when Allah ﷻ is saying that everything that he does, he does out of 
revelation. Whether he knows that he is doing it revelation or not, but he is doing it through revelation. It is a command from Allah SWT. And that is the splitting of the chest. Inshallah, uh, I was hoping to do beyond this as well and talking about the passing of the mother of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But inshallah, we will leave it for the next class, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakumullah khair. I know the class went long. One hour and 15 minutes, mashallah. Um, so, uh, you know, kudos to everyone. All the little kids come to me. Even if you didn't get a lollipop, you can come and get one. Okay, little kids. Okay. So, you can come and get a lollipop. And uh, I, we have a few left to take, uh, you can give it to you, inshallah. And we have a few minutes before our dance. You can go and do your wudu and what not. Is that? You want this one? Okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah, did you get one? Did you get one? Did you get one? Did you get one? There you go. And did you get one? No? There you go. Okay.